Welcome, good evening to all of you, and thank you for braving this weather and being here. Um, we were supposed to have a full house, but we're good with all of you, so great. Um, so this is the last of our fall uh, studies in Islam Speaker series, so we will resume again in January. Um, we're really glad to have Professor Kaplan here, and my colleague, um, Sahani Sahani, will introduce him more appropriately. Ooh. Thank you for being right. here. Thanks. Thank you for coming. Um, so I'm just going to read a little biography of Prof. Kaplan, and I think we're ready to hear what you have to say. Craig Kaplan is an associate prof in the David R. Cheriton School of Computer Science at the University of Waterloo. He has a Bachelor of Math in Pure Mathematics and Computer Science from Waterloo and an MS and PhD in computer science from the University of Washington. He studied the application of computer graphics and mathematics to problems in art, architecture, and design, and is an expert on topics such as Islamic ge geometric patterns and computational applications of tiling theory. He is the editor of the Journal of Mathematics and the Arts and helped to organize the annual Bridges Conference on Arts and Mathematics. So help me welcome Dr. Kaplan for his talk. Thanks. Thanks. Th thanks for coming. It's uh, really awful weather out there. And uh, it is a pleasure to come out and talk to kind of a different audience. I mean, I recognize some familiar faces. but. Uh, an audience that hopefully will share my interest in Islamic star patterns, which, you know, I can try to convince people in math that this is an exciting topic, but it's not something that a lot of people there study. So, uh, as Sahila said, my research has a lot to do with trying to understand the structure of patterns, tilings, ornamental design, and then try to understand how to use mathematics and computer science techniques to create new design, empower artists, make artists more expressive, get them to the, um, the answers they want more, uh, more quickly and more creatively. Um, this is something I've been looking at since graduate school. I mean, the topic of my PhD thesis was Islamic geometric patterns and the art of M.C. Escher, not necessarily the intersection of those things, but both topics together. Um, one caveat I should say, I don't actually study Islam. I mean, it's, it's great to be here, but I won't pretend that this will be a study in Islam. This is more, this is maybe a study near Islam, right, in the same vicinity as Islam. My work is obviously informed by Islamic art, but more as an abstract style of geometric design and not because of its religious significance in particular and not so much even because of its cultural significance, although to the extent that that helps me understand the patterns, I care about it. I'll say a little bit about that. So first of all, uh, what, what am I going to talk about? I'll, I'll take you through a quick tour, slightly delayed quick tour, of the work I've done trying to understand and create Islamic star patterns. I'm not going to go over all of the algorithms I use in detail, as I might if I were giving a talk for an audience of computer scientists. I figure that that's not as relevant here. What I'd like to do instead is just say a little bit about why computer science should matter at all in this context, why we should care about using math and CS to solve problems in Islamic art. And then after that, I'll take you through a tour of some of the things I've done with Islamic art. I, I can't do a complete survey of the contemporary world of art ba you know, based on Islamic ideas. That's vast, and uh, I'm not really an expert on it. So uh, you know, actually, you're better off talking to Sahela, as a matter of fact, who both knows a lot about it and practices it herself. But let me begin by explaining what I mean by Islamic geometric patterns. There's lots of really wonderful, easily accessible examples I can point to. This is a very famous tiling from the Alhambra in Spain. It's actually made out of small baked tiles, even the, the little, these little bent sticks. It's an incredible achievement. And this is an abstract geometric design that you would find in the Alhambra. <coughs> um, after having studied this for many years, I finally got to visit the Alhambra in person this year. So I have freshly fired up with excitement about this. Uh, this topic. So here's just one more design. This one's not executed in tile, but it's carved into plaster or stone. Uh, and you know, just as evidence that I was physically present, <laughs> there's me taking a picture of that design. 
Yeah, it could be, photo could be Photoshop. Might not be me. Might have scoured the internet to find someone who looks like me who wears the same kind of shirts as I do. Um, uh, there, you'll find, these are both flat examples, but of course you'll find Islamic geometric patterns on other surfaces. Here's a wonderful dome from Iran that's got a, a pattern. It's actually quite complex to adjust the geometry to fit the changing curvature of a dome. Uh, it's a topic that I can't get to today, although I'll talk a little bit about things in 3D. Uh, you'll find examples carved in wood and of course examples uh, taken from elements that came from mosques. So here's a wonderful example from the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. I was in London over the last year on sabbatical, which is I was able to visit the Persian art room many times. Uh, and this is from a minbar. It's a 15th century minbar from a, a mosque in Cairo. Another place you'll see lots of wonderful examples of geometric design are in the art of the book. So you have a couple of beautiful illuminated Qurans. This one is in the Museum of Turkish and Islamic Art, which I think is in Istanbul, but I'm not certain. Um, and here's just one more beautiful illuminated Quran. You can see there's the interaction of lots of different styles of art in one place. You have the rigid abstract geometry of what I'll call in a second an Islamic star pattern. And you also have these beautiful symmetric floral designs that fill in the gaps. The floral designs are a little bit more freeform and less abstractly geometric, but we could still refer to them as Islamic geometric patterns because they do have a lot of mathematical structure. The most obvious example being that most of the designs that are inside symmetric tiles themselves are laid out symmetrically. Fair enough. You know, in fact, the world of Islamic geometric design is not just about these flat, abstract star designs that I'll be talking about for the rest of today, but there's also these floral abstract designs. Calligraphy plays a major role in Islamic art, as you probably know. And some forms of, uh, of Islamic calligraphy have a very rigid geometric structure. And of course, uh, mukarnas, which is a form of architectural corbeling, sort of to fill in the corner underneath a dome. That is very geometric, and, and so on and so on. Uh, textile design and rugs. And, and uh, there's, there's lots of other areas where this stuff is practiced. But I'm going to focus on you know, the topic that I've studied for many years, which is what I sometimes call Islamic star patterns as a special class of Islamic geometric patterns. Why do I call them that? Well, I mean, hopefully you can squint at this and see the stars peeking out at you. The most obvious ones are these big 16-pointed stars in the Alhambra design. There's also a wide a, a big scattering of these eight-pointed stars in two orientations, which is a little bit unusual, actually. I can. There you go. So there's the stars in isolation. And these are pretty easy to construct mathematically. You can construct a regular polygon. All the sides are the same length and all the angles are the same. Uh, put a point of a star in the center of every edge of that regular polygon. And then take the, the, the lines joining those points and just bring them in towards the center of the polygon by some distance. And you end up with a whole variety of stars. Uh, another way to do it, if you're interested, is you can um, take points regularly spaced around a polygon and join them up in, uh, with skipping some points. So if I put eight points around a regular octagon and join them up skipping every other point, I end up with two overlapping squares or one particular eight-pointed star. Here I'm going to go from here, skip one, two, three, four, five, six, skip, yeah, skip five, go here, skip five, go here, skip five, go here. Interesting process to draw these stars if that's how you want to do it. I might also, I might also identify these distorted five-pointed stars as being star elements in this pattern. It's not really crucial to have an exact accounting of what qualifies as a star. I am most interested in the presence of these very regular stars because that's really the most identifying characteristic of a star pattern. So there's a whole variety of examples of these all around the world, all around uh, the Muslim world, of course. I mean, from northern Africa, southern Europe, all the way across into the Middle East, Persia, all, as, as far as uh, you know, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan and, and, and India, um, you can find designs like these. So we have a whole wealth of examples to draw from. The question is, how were they constructed? I mean, what do we know about how these things were drawn originally? We have lots of examples we can look at as finished designs. But as a mathematician, I want to know where they came from. What was the artist thinking who first came up with a given pattern? 
And the funny thing is we don't have a lot of understanding of where these patterns came from. We don't actually know a lot about how they were designed. Uh, there's, there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, one reason is that it was kind of a secret. People who were practicing this art form hundreds of years ago had a, a lock on the market, right? It was, a, it was the, the, the province of guilds. And they weren't so, uh, they weren't so willing to share their, their trade secrets with other people. So there's no smoking gun. There's no book out there that says, you know, from 500 years ago, that is the grand book of how to design all star patterns. Of course, that's kind of nice from a mathematical point of view because it leaves us with a puzzle. I can study all of the patterns that are out there in the world and ask, what kind of system can I devise to account for the structure in those patterns? Now, that being said, there are a few bits of evidence that we can point to, a few interesting documents that remain from hundreds of years ago that tell us something about how these patterns were designed. One famous one is the Topkapi scroll from, uh, from Turkey. And this is, as far as we can tell, it looks like a design manual that belonged to a group of designers back in the day. And they would use this as a pattern resource book. And if you look closely at the scroll, you will see drawings that seem to have hints about how the final designs were produced. In this case, the final star pattern is pretty much the blue lines, maybe with the red lines, the red solid lines superimposed, but faintly in the background, you will see some dotted red lines that seem to subdivide the world in a meaningful way and break up the pattern into these units that look a little bit more manageable. And in some sense, that's where I'm headed with my technique for constructing star patterns, and I'll get there soon. Um, so this is kind of interesting. And in fact, in other parts of the scroll, there are even fainter marks that suggest what the structure of the patterns are. There are actually invisible marks where somebody scraped some preparatory lines into the scroll with like a, a, a metal point to use as a guide. So you can't even see them if you photograph the scroll. You have to kind of look at the edge on or do a, a high resolution 3D scan or something to get at the real information there. Another document that survives uh, from the late 19th century are the Mirza Akbar, Akbar scrolls, which live in the Victorian Albert Museum in London. These were brought to London from Tehran in 1876, where they were purchased uh, you know, by someone who was visiting on behalf of the museum. It's a little bit harder to talk about the authenticity and usefulness of these, of these works, of these scrolls. It's not clear that they have you know, any real long history. The person who is the curator of this material at the museum has a theory that maybe you know, somebody went to Tehran and said, do you have some drawings that we can take back? And they said, yeah, 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 and come back the next day, come back tomorrow. And they went off and just like scribbled whatever they had handy onto pieces of paper. And the, you, know, you can tell that these drawings kind of look loose and a little bit rough, maybe not as useful for, a design, for design purposes. If you're interested in this stuff, I will point you at one really useful reference that is worth getting. Uh, it's a classic book, also from around the same time, 1879. Uh, Jules Bourguin created a beautiful compendium of Islamic star patterns. Uh, I think it originally came as like a booklet with a bunch of separate plates. Nowadays, it's very easy to get because there's a Dover edition of just the plates, and it's really cheap, right? So you can get just page after page of these an abstract diagrams, these line drawings that represent patterns that he found around the world. Now, again, the, you know, addressing the mystery of how to construct these patterns, you can look and see faint, there are faint lines and circles in one corner of each pattern that try to give you some hint of how to construct it. I wouldn't take those too literally. It's not clear that they mean anything apart from Here's the recipe that Bourguin came up with after staring at the original pattern for long enough. He came up with some technique that allowed him to do a reasonably good reproduction. So you know, whether or not that corresponds to what was done historically is much more debatable. Probably it doesn't. Uh, that doesn't mean you couldn't potentially use these if you wanted to rec recreate these patterns. But there's no system to it. And I'll say more about that in a second. There's one more. So now, of course, Islamic star patterns like these are still heavily in practice today. People make them all the time. Um, and in fact, earlier this year when I was in London, I took a course um, by an organization that calls itself Art of Islamic Pattern, 
which is a couple of people who graduated, a couple of artists who graduated from the Prince's School. Uh, what's it called? The, the Prince's School of Traditional Arts in London. And they now teach uh, the construction of star patterns and floral design. And so I got to see how an artist views the construction of star patterns. And they view it very much in a traditional way. They want to draw these patterns by hand with a pencil or a pen or what have you. And that means going way back and picking up the original tools that we're pretty sure artists would have used back in history. This, at least, we have a pretty good idea about because we know that um, the Islamic world uh, were the people who were most versed in geometry in that era. The, this is, a, from, you know, I can't read this, but my understanding, of course, is that this is a, an Arabic translation of Euclid's Elements. And there's an interesting history here, of course. Uh, Euclid's Elements, of course, was created around three or 400 BC, written in Greek. Uh, there were early translations of the elements into Latin in the first millennium, but they were basically all lost and forgotten by Western Europe. Um, you know, around 1000. And it's really through the Arabic translations that Euclid was re-imported into the West. So we can be pretty sure that Arabic scholars were the ones, in places like Baghdad, were the ones who were really well versed in geometry. And by extension, the artists who were practicing star patterns would have had all of this knowledge at their disposal. And, you know, it's fair to say that in order to construct a lot of the patterns they constructed, they would have used the basic tools of Euclidean geometry, namely the compass and straight edge. So when I took this course earlier this year, I was taught how to construct star patterns by compass and straight edge. And I want to show you an example. It's not important that you memorize or learn or, you know, understand every single step of what I'm going to show you, but it's just to show you how much effort is involved. And, and, and what a recipe for constructing a star pattern might look like. Um, so this is one that I actually did when I was in this class. You start with a line and you identify two points and that just sort of sets the scale for the whole pattern. I'll go through this pretty quickly. Draw two arcs like this. Uh, this is actually part of the construction. This is the very first theorem in Euclid's elements because these three points give you an equilateral triangle. That's not actually relevant here. I get to draw a vertical bisector there. That gives me a, a vertical line that is perpendicular to the horizontal one I started with. And then I draw a circle starting at that point whose radius is chosen to exactly meet the center here. I draw another circle of the same radius up at this point. And now something a little bit interesting happens. Uh, it turns out that I've already got three points of what's going to be a regular pentagon, maybe. So I've got these two points are going to be two points of a pentagon, and this is going to be the peak of a pentagon. And I just have to identify two more points down here, and I'll be able to complete a pentagon. And I can do that with just a few more arcs, and now I've got the five points of a pentagon. Very interesting, though, is, that, is to note, I want to point out, this is not actually a regular pentagon. It looks pretty good. It's, it's, it's pretty close to regular. And if you're willing to do a little bit of math, a little bit of trigonometry, you can like measure this length and this length and this length and measure this angle and this angle and this angle and compare them to what the lengths and angles ought to be for a pentagon. And you, re you can see that it's actually very close. It's, it's an approximation of a regular pentagon to within a couple of parts in a thousand. I'm showing this to you. I mean, it's not directly relevant in the pattern that's eventually going to emerge and you can construct truly regular pentagons with a compass and straight edge. But it's interesting the way that we can cut corners. And in fact, the way you would want to, because the other techniques for constructing pentagons would be a whole mess more circles and lines and, and other doodads that I need in order to get actual regularity. Because this is so precise, this is close enough that if you were drawing it by hand, you wouldn't be able to notice the discrepancy. Or put another way, the error you introduce just by the fact that you're using real world tools on a physical piece of paper is greater than the mathematical error in this drawing. So maybe it doesn't matter. Now, if you're uh, fairly masochistic, you might then redo this entire process to draw a second pentagon upside down. If you're a little bit more savvy, you might get out some tracing paper so that you can trace the pentagon you just drew twice. And that's a little bit faster. So we're actually extending Euclid's elements with the addition of tracing paper, which is something he didn't account for. <clears throat> Few more lines. I'm going to identify the rectangle that contains this hexagon. I'm going to 
add a circle so I have these regularly spaced points around it. It turns out these are all, there are 10 points spaced regularly around a circle. I draw a few more construction lines that are easily found as you know, joining various points in this diagram. At this point, things are starting to get a little bit crazy, but I can pull out a subset of these blue lines and get that diagram. And now I can sort of throw away all the construction lines. And now I have a unit, which if I repeat in a grid, I get an actual pattern. Okay, so that, that's actually, I mean, and I didn't show you all the steps, right? What does it mean to repeat this in a grid? Again, if you're smart, you're gonna do this with tracing paper. I'll construct one unit, and then I'll put tracing paper down on top of it and slide the paper along and trace out multiple versions of that, multiple copies of that unit. Um, and, you know, I didn't repeat all the steps that I needed to get a second pentagon and so on. So this, I mean, this, there's nothing impossible about this. There's nothing that prevents anybody from going off and learning this technique and reproducing it. But boy, it's hard. It's, it's, it's difficult manual labor. It's easy to make mistakes. Um, which is not to say anything negative about the craft aspect of making Islamic art. It's highly worthwhile. And I mean, I'm incredibly grateful that I got a chance to practice it at that level. Uh, but as a mathematician and a computer scientist, I look at this and I say, this, this doesn't help me. This doesn't help me understand Islamic star patterns and it doesn't help me make them efficiently. You know, if I, if I have uh, some technique for constructing a star pattern and I build the tile and then I repeat it and then I look at it and I was like, mm, it's not quite what I wanted. I just, can you move that line a little bit over here and then redo it? Well, that's, you know, that's, a, that's quite a painful thing to have to do. Whereas if I can automate this to some extent with computer graphics, then making mistakes is much less painful. In fact, it's pretty much completely painless. I'll say more about that in a second. But the, the real problem with this, from my point of view, the thing that I respond to as a computer scientist is that there was no enlightenment here. There's no, there's no insight in this recipe. This recipe is a, a hard-coded sequence of instructions that, if I do correctly, produces one design, and that's it. I can't adapt it to other situations. It doesn't teach me anything about any other Islamic star pattern. In some way, the recipe is as much a finished product of a design process as this picture. And there was some underlying a priori set of ideas that inspired that recipe that I don't have access to. In some sense, right, it's the recipes that got passed down through history, but in this pre-digested form that tells us nothing about how to actually design star patterns, only how to draw them, which is a different thing. So, the computer scientist in me says, show me a higher level of abstraction. I want to back away from these hard-coded recipes and try to understand some kind of more mathematical abstract model that gives me a machine I can use to generate new star patterns on the fly. If I have a mathematical model, chances are I can encode it as a computer program. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, what's... You know, what's the method? What's the underlying idea that gave rise to all of these recipes? The recipes are, are, um, are beautiful things in and of themselves. And there's a lot of nice Islamic art where, uh, contemporary art, where you see the finished pattern, but the artist has also chosen to give you a lot of the construction elements. And that's, that's a beautiful thing, that kind of scaffolding. Um, but... What I seek as a computer scientist is some underlying explanation for where these recipes came from. I want to take a step back and understand if there's a model that I can use to drive the creation of new star patterns. And, you know, ideally as a computer scientist, if I have that model, I can then find new degrees of freedom, new ways to vary the construction that I've just used in new directions that maybe even traditional Islamic art wasn't able to explore before. Because we have tools now that weren't available 500 or 1,000 years ago or even really 100 years ago. We have much more sophisticated mathematics, which, you know, which is not any kind of insult to the, the brilliant work that was done 1,000 years ago. We just know more now. We have beautiful theories mathematically for tilings, for tessellations, and for understanding the symmetries of designs. And even simple things like trigonometry, we have calculators that can calculate the sine function and the cosine function to as many decimal places as we need. 
which was, a, again, a very painful process even a few hundred years ago. <clears throat> so how can we use these modern tools and turn them into algorithms and give ourselves the power to create new star patterns? Well, so here's my inspiration. There's a few different ways that people have proposed for constructing star patterns these days which are effectively reinventions of techniques. We don't really know what was done originally, but we can propose new ideas and hope that they give us some ability to, to account for the structure of historical patterns. That's all I'm asking for. I'm not going to make any claim that this is what would have been done originally. So my inspiration came from Hankin, who was part of the British Archaeological Survey of India, which would have been in the early 20th century or late 19th century. And he saw a few examples of designs uh, that were done in plaster that had some extra construction lines in them, like the um, top copy scroll. And from that, he came up with some ideas of how you might uh, construct these patterns, one way to do it. And so what he wrote in his paper was, it is necessary to cover the surface to be decorated with a network of polygons in contact. And that's why we call this the polygons in contact method. And then through the center of each side of each polygon, lines are drawn. The lines cross each other like a letter X, and they keep going until they meet other lines of similar origin. So you imagine that at the center of every edge of, well, what is effectively a tiling, a tessellation of the plane, from the center of every edge, you grow an X. And you assume that you're growing a similar X from the center of every other edge. And where, where two lines meet, of the, where two uh, arms of these X's meet, you cut them off and stop. You stop, stop growing. This is the key step in this construction technique, is the idea that I have these arms growing and I cut them off. And I get one small element of my design. And I do that everywhere. And this is something that can be automated very nicely. I mean, it's very easy to write a computer program that kind of represents these X's and understands how to take the intersections of lines and cut off these drawings as they're happening. Um, so in fact, uh, I wanted to make one more simplification that Hankin didn't, which is because we understand more now about tiling theory than even we did in the 20s when he wrote this, um, I'm going to restrict my attention to what's happening inside individual tiles. I don't really need to consider an X growing out of an edge between two tiles. I'm going to look at what happens inside each tile in isolation, and I'm going to grow, I guess, a V coming out of the center of every edge. It's just one minor simplification, but I'm going to look at what happens inside tiles one by one. So let me take these three shapes. I haven't exactly told you where, you know, I, I pulled these shapes out of thin air, but, you know, they exist. There they are. And I'll say a little bit more about where I get shapes like these a little bit later. So this is a regular 10-sided polygon, regular decagon. This is a kind of bow tie hexagon. And this is a more elongated convex hexagon. And I'm going to draw my V so that the arms of the V make a 54-degree angle with each edge of each polygon. And if I do that and I suitably cut off these arms when they meet other arms uh, from other edge midpoints, I get these motifs in the tiles. If you think about it a little bit, it's pretty natural that if you grow a V out of every edge center in a regular polygon, what jumps out as a result is going to be a star. So that's good. As long as I choose tilings that have lots of regular polygons in them, it looks like I'm going to get designs that have lots of stars, because I'm going to stitch this together in a second. And the bow tie makes this design, and the, the other hexagon makes this kind of design. And that's just a natural byproduct of following that, that uh, polygons in contact technique. Now, if I assemble the tiles in this arrangement, making an infinite periodic tiling, and I copy those motifs into each tile, and then erase the tiling, I get the same design I had before. But I would claim that I have a little bit more insight into where the design came from now. I don't have a prepackaged recipe. I have, a, I have a, a, a technique that's broken down into a couple of phases. First, I specify the tessellation I want to start with. And then I have this fixed procedure for creating a motif for every element of that tessellation that depends on one continuous variable, which is the angle you make here. So I've broken the problem down into two, two subproblems. I need to tell you where the tessellations come from, and I need to uh, tell you how to choose angles and how to construct the design as a result. I guess um, 
I'm going to jump here and show you how this works live, because why not, right? It's like one dominant polygon and then two subordinates. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. I mean, if the goal of constructing a star pattern is to get lots of stars, then I'm guessing you're going to want to have a lot of regular polygons. And so in some sense, the goal is to construct tilings that have like big regular polygons that fill most of space, and then you somehow fill in the extra space with irregular bits as needed. Um, now, the, the shapes that I just showed you are a little bit more special than that. <clears throat> right? These three shapes are part of a more specific system. So it's not fair to say that like this and this just kind of arose and we dealt with it. The, these shapes are, are really themselves kind of enshrined in the history of Islamic design as part of um, what are sometimes called gira tiles. I, I think I've pronounced that somewhat in the right neighborhood, right? G-I-R-I-H in English, which my understanding is the word for not. K-N-O-T, not. Anyway. So, you know, in general, the idea is, yeah, I'm going to try to construct a tiling with lots of big regular polygons, and then I'll figure out a way to fill in the rest of space with other stuff. And I'll say a little bit more about that. But let me just give a live demo, because the point is, I've reduced the problem down to this kind of formulaic system that I can encode in a computer program. And that lets me explore a space of designs in a really quick, efficient way. So there's... Um, it's actually a little bit broken, but there you go. There's the tiling I just showed you, although I guess it's, it's rotated. No, it's, uh, no, I guess that's the, right, that's the orientation I had. Uh, let me just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn that down. No, I'm gonna turn this knob down. Some of these knobs are purely for demonstration purposes. <coughs> there we go, so there's the tiling writ large. Now. What happens here that's, that's fun is this actually will simulate the process of growing those X's or V's if you want to think about them that way. And I'll grow them until they meet other V's and then they just stop. I've pre-calculated how far they have to go before they stop and so I let them grow until exactly that point. And if I erase the tiling, then yes, you get an interesting design. This isn't exactly the same design as I had before. I have to press this magic two checkbox which um, allows the, the lines to pass a little bit further into large regular polygons in a way that I'm not really going to go into. The other thing that's going on here is I think this is an angle of 45 degrees. So I do have to, um, I do have to adjust the angle to get closer to 54 degrees. And I realize as I'm doing this, I can't see what I've got. That's 51 degrees. And it should go up in increments. There's 54 degrees. OK. So there's the design we started with. And of course, the nice thing about this that you can't do by hand, you know, first example of something you can't do by hand is this. No, I want more. No, no, my house is really big. I need a lot of this. Right? It's trivial to make as much of this as you want. And this is one of the real powers of computer science that we don't have with handmade art, is that repetition is free. The computer is really good at stupid, mindless repetition. And so I can break the task of design down into the interesting creative human part of coming up with these, uh, these tilings and choosing angles, and the boring, repetitious part, which is copying out the design. Even if I want to eventually take this and use it as a guide for drawing or painting something by hand, this still lets me explore the space of possibilities much more efficiently than I can do just by drawing it by hand. And of course, the other thing I have that I don't have otherwise are these beautiful continuous degrees of freedom. I can explore a whole range of star patterns in a way where I'd have to produce a hand drawing for every single one of these uh, just to see what it looked like. Uh, there, and of course, you know, once I've done that, I can plug in any other tiling I want. So I said something about where do these tilings come from? Well. There's a lot of possible sources for uh, the tilings that are used in Islamic art. Some tilings have just been known since prehistory. I mean, the three obvious ones are hexagons and uh, squares and triangles. And these do yield uh, reasonable Islamic star patterns as well. There's, let me bring the tiling in a little bit there, right? So a simple hexagonal tiling does produce a range of well-known Islamic star patterns. If I set that to be 
uh, 60 degrees, which again I can't quite see, then I will get this kind of classic design of six pointed stars surrounded by hexagons. Yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, like, I, you know, we've heard of the like, golden ratio like, in the uh, geometry, <laughs> uh, and like, what I mean, you had 454 degrees, uh, uh, yep. 45 degrees. Somehow it wasn't as pleasing as when you had 54. Nice, degrees. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, is that related to the golden ratio? Probably not, but the 54 degree angle is related to the geometry of the decagon that was used as one of the elements in there. Like, if you look at, so why was it 54 degrees? That's a good question. Uh, what if I told you that like this angle here is already 54 degrees? The, these shapes, all of the angles in these tiles are multiples of, 36 to, uh, of 18, multiples of 18 degrees. So in some sense, it's natural that the angle I choose here is also a multiple of 18 degrees, that it's somehow related to the geometry of the tiles. And yeah, if you look at what people write about these techniques, you see that you know, they, they kind of say, in the polygons and contact world, they say, oh yeah, for this kind of tiling, you need this angle or this angle or this angle, and the other range doesn't matter, you don't care. And they don't say why, but the answer is it's related to the tiles themselves. It's related to the geometry of the tiles. <clears throat> the other thing you can do in a, in a system like this, uh, which is really lovely, is of course, explore different styles of uh, decoration. So, of course, these simple line drawings are just a scaffolding that you should build upon with artistic, uh, artistic interpretation. So, very typical thing that you'd want to do is render these lines as an interlacement. And, you know, again, with, with computer graphics algorithms, it's very easy to do that. You just, the, there's a whole theorem that says that if I have, well, the first thing you do is this. If there's, a, there's a theorem that says that if I can color the regions in my pattern with only two colors, such that adjacent regions never have the same color, which, based on the nature of the polygons and contact technique, will always work. It just happens to work out that way. Then, indeed, you can always also interlace the bands in such a way that every band passes alternately over and under the other bands it encounters. And uh, so that turns out to be kind of nice. And in fact, you can take this further if you want. I think, uh, I don't know if this is going to work. So here's a slightly more complicated drawing style in which the interlacements are themselves kind of thickened and realized as a, as a pure piece of geometry. The nice thing about this is that if you actually cut these holes out of, say, a piece of wood, then the entire thing will hold together. You'll have like a kind of screen. And I'll show some examples of that. Yeah, you know. Does the, which, which one, sorry. Oh, um, does it have a name? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I've I, I, I first saw that theorem in um, a study book for the Putnam exam. It's used as an example of uh, an inductive proof. The fact that these kinds of designs can always be two colored. I don't think there's a specific theorem that says if it's two colored, then it can be interlaced. But I can suggest where you might look to find such a theorem stated. So if you, if you ask me later, I can try to find some, uh, some places. Again, I'm trying to gloss over a lot of the, the really uh, deep mathematical details because uh, I don't want this to be a math talk necessarily. Uh, so what else do I want to show you here? I mean, there are, there are a bunch of other tilings, of course. Um, here's, here's one more just for fun. Uh, that's closely related to the other one I started with, except there are no convex hexagons. It's just decagons and bow ties. Oh, I did want to show one other thing. Uh, let me go back to these. I talked about the three regular tilings, triangles, squares, and hexagons. There are also the next level of difficulty of tilings historically are the so-called Archimedean tilings in which every tile is a regular polygon, but they're not necessarily all the same regular polygon. And these have a long history as well. Um, so I can make a design out of that. I'm going to go down to about 45 degrees. Now what happens that's interesting at 45 degrees is you can also move the starting points of those x's away from the centers of the edges. And as I do that, what happens is I get little squares around the contact points of all those edges. And you get what are sometimes called two-point patterns. And this is a whole interesting range of design in and of itself. Um, these are especially nice to interlace because um, 
it almost is a kind of chain mail. What you get is a whole bunch of small isolated rings that all interlace with each other. There you go, there's that. Um, and of course, but the main benefit here is how easy and, and, and efficiently I can explore a wide space of possible designs. Uh, parameterized over the choice of tiling, the choice of angle, the style, the, the two-point patterns, and so on. Yeah. So yeah, I guess you can uh, uh, parameterize over it. I guess like a, like a kind of uh, procedural generation, but thinking perhaps the next step is a kind of like a, um, a domain specific language for the type. Of that would be cool too. Yeah, I mean it. It it would be possible to kind of invent some some sort of Islamic star pattern programming language, that, or or do you mean more geometric design more generally? Yeah, kind of like a language. It would be kind of cool. I, I've thought about that a little bit on and off. Um, in the end, I kind of prefer having a, a pretty user interface with knobs that I can, that I can turn. But the, program, the programmer in me does see the value in trying to abstract this into some kind of programmatic system. You mentioned that a lot of these patterns were based on Euclidean because, you know, like works and books. And I'm thinking, did they ever move beyond, like, like a, you know, like doing a non-Euclidean job? Not as far as, well, very limited. I, I think there's maybe one spherical design on a sword pommel. But let me get to that because I'm going to, if I, if I do have time, I'll get to non-Euclidean patterns. Whew. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to race a little bit too. So there's that. Um, now this might, and going back and looking at the top copy scroll, now maybe this, the polygons and contact technique can help us understand a little bit about what's happening here. You can see that maybe these dotted red lines are the polygons and contact. And indeed, it's probably the case that all of these lines in the final design are in fact forming a 54 degree angle with all of the uh, tile edges. So, you know, that is a little piece of historical evidence for the polygons and contact technique. But again, let me emphasize as a computer scientist trying to, trying to create new Islamic star patterns, it's not crucial to me that this is a historical technique. There are people who are very interested to know if this is what was done 500 years ago. I'm interested in knowing can I create things that are recognizably Islamic star patterns? Because I want to innovate, create new ideas that are within that space, within that aesthetic. Okay, so where do the tilings come from? I already said this. You, uh, the three regular tilings are very well known. They go back you know, at least thousands of years. There are other tilings that are relevant to Islamic star pattern design. Here's an Archimedean tiling. This one's actually not Archimedean, although it kind of looks like it, but it is all made out of regular polygons. And here are two that look a little bit like the one I showed you. They have regular polygons and bow ties together. Um, and part of the research that I did in Islamic star pattern design is to try to understand where these tilings came from. And I developed a system for constructing these kinds of tilings based on the wallpaper groups based on the, the, the planar symmetry groups. And I'm not going to talk about the details behind that, but it immediately gives you access to these tilings, which are a little bit weird and irregular because of these bow ties, but no longer sort of off limits. I can get access to them. I can account for their structure mathematically. Another important element in the design of star patterns are these rosettes. Often you will find that a central star is surrounded by a layer of these kind of barrel-shaped hexagons. And we do want to account for that as well. Now, it's possible to give an explicit compass and straight edge construction for the geometry of a rosette inscribed in a regular polygon. And there are nice old papers on how to do this. The key, it's actually fairly easy. The key is to find this point S right here. And everything else about this rosette follows from this magic point. And that adapts nicely to polygons with different numbers of sides and so on. But I also explored an interesting variation on that in which I offer a, a way to transform this tiling into a new tiling in which the rosettes arise naturally via um, the polygons and contact technique. So it tries to do everything with this one algorithmic construction. Uh, and if necessary, I will produce a new tiling that allows that construction to do what you want. So this is, I kind of like this because it, it takes the, the, these mysterious rosette objects and shows where they came from, shows why they might have arisen in the first place. So I have these, uh, in this tab here, I should have some tilings that do this. So here's like 10RD, which you can see, whoa, that's pretty complicated. But if I drag that back. 
Hey, come on. There we go. If I go up to uh, 72 degrees or so, you will see that these rosettes are just emerging as a byproduct of the structure of this tiling rather than needing to be explicitly constructed. Uh, that's kind of a nice, uh, a nice innovation. So I have a system that, given a set of tilings that you start with, and I account for the structure of a lot of these tilings, will be able to turn them into a range of interesting star patterns. The next question as a computer scientist with interest in design is what are you going to do with this? How can you make use of this to innovate, to create new ideas in design? So I want to take you on a tour of some of the stuff I've done over the years as variations on star patterns. The first source of inspiration are metamorphoses uh, so Escher was very famous for creating these metamorphosis objects, and of course, I've done a lot, I spent a lot of time studying Escher, so this is something of interest to me. Escher was also heavily inspired by Islamic art. Escher traveled from the Netherlands twice to the Alhambra, and he and his wife sketched a lot of the mathematical designs there. And he loved the beauty of the abstract mathematical patterns, except that he found them too abstract. He said, where are the birds and fish and lizards and so on? And, you know, Islamic geometric art tends to shy away from figurative representation, from animal and, and human forms. But that was no good for Escher. So he took a lot of what he saw in places like the Alhambra and developed them into real world patterns. Incredible stuff. Now, William Huff, who was an architecture and design professor in the 20th century, was also heavily inspired by Escher. And he created this style of design called parquet deformations that he used to give as an exercise to the students in his class to draw these by hand. It's a very challenging exercise. But I also, I love these. These are wonderful kind of almost storytelling, almost a narrative flow in one direction as a tiling evolves and changes and metamorph undergoes metamorphosis. So it was natural for me to ask whether Islamic star patterns could be subject to a similar kind of metamorphosis. And in fact, it's not even really that hard to do. I showed you that I had this continuous parameter that I could vary, this angle that I make with the edges in a tiling. So why don't I vary that angle within the scope of one design? And you can see that I've started to do that here. I can make the angle of contact be varying spatially in, uh, in one piece of design. So you get these nice long linear designs that evolve but are still recognizably Islamic star patterns. So I call these Islamic parquet deformations. And they're nice because I think they do live comfortably in the tradition of Islamic geometric patterns, but there's no way people would have wanted to execute these back historically because every single tile is different, or at least every slice through this tiling is made out of differently shaped tiles. So there's no way you're going to hire tile cutters to make all of these tiles where every single one is unique. First of all, the labor would be immense, and second of all, uh, you know, the, the chance of error is too great. It's just not going to fit together when you're done. But these days, it's not a problem. Uh, another interesting new innovation that has been applied by me and others to Islamic star patterns is the use of aperiodic tilings. So I'm not going to go into all the math behind aperiodic tilings, but they are very modern. They, they only really existed for about 50 years or so that we've understood that they, they are possible. An aperiodic tiling is one that doesn't repeat in any direction. So it's got this kind of rough, irregular appearance, but still a lot of structure. And this is one of the most famous. This is one of the Penrose tilings. Now, it turns out I'm gonna, it's possible to put little fragments of Islamic star pattern in each of these rhombuses that join together to form an overall design. So let me take this 72-degree rhombus. I can take the same decagons I had earlier and I notice that if I put a decagon at each of these vertices, then they exactly meet each other, and what's left over is one of those bow ties. Ha! Huh, perfect. I know how to fill those up. That's easy. I put these things in the decagons, I put this motif in the bow ties, and I'm done. I, I, I cut it off to, you know, there's the design that I need inside one rhombus. Now, I also need to do something for the 36-degree rhombus. Life is not quite that good because the decagons overlap each other when I put them down on the vertices of the rhombus. So I have to clean it up somehow, and it's a little bit ad hoc, but here's one possible solution. 
I get rid of a little bit of the extra complexity here and I end up with a simple design in which I've compromised and I have sort of semi-incomplete stars. And I get this motif. But now what's great about this is that I can join these rhombuses together and get what would in theory fill the plane with a non-repeating aperiodic Islamic star pattern. And there are other people who have looked into this topic. Uh, one recent one, is about 2007, that got a lot of press was an article in Science, in the journal Science, by Peter Liu and Paul Steinhardt, who are actually physicists, who talked a little bit about the relationship between these aperiodic tilings and traditional Islamic star patterns. So this is the spandrel from uh, the darb e Imam Mosque in uh, Isfahan. And they claimed, they claimed that the kind of self-similar structure of this pattern suggests in some way that the artists who created it hundreds of years ago had some understanding of aperiodic tilings. And that is a very bold claim, and I think it's controversial. It caused a lot of, a lot of negative response in the community that studies these Islamic star patterns. I, think, I don't think they provided enough evidence to convince people that that's actually true. It's quite easy to discover this kind of self-similarity without being specifically aware of aperiodicity, which is a, a much richer, more contemporary mathematical topic. Nevertheless, we have these beautiful designs that geometrically seem to belong in a similar class. Okay, so now, getting to what you were asking before. Can we adapt these designs to non-Euclidean geometry? This is one of the topics I studied as part of my PhD. So, you know, we have this fixed set of ways that tiles can fit together in the plane. If I want to use squares and only squares, well, I have to have four around every point where they meet. I can't have three or five. You know, it's a 90-degree angle. That's not my, I don't get to change that. But I can change it as long as I'm willing to move off of the flat plane. So, for example, I can think about what are the regular tilings of the sphere instead of the regular tilings of the plane. And if you're willing to adapt what you think of as a tiling to a round surface of a sphere, then you can make the legitimate claim that there are five regular tilings of the sphere, and they basically correspond to the five platonic solids. Tetrahedron, cube, octahedron, dodecahedron, icosahedron. <clears throat> and in fact, you know, if you look at the axioms of Euclidean geometry, and the, you know, we can't get all the way into it, but if you look at the way Euclidean geometry is formulated, a lot of it works just fine on the sphere. You have to jigger it a little bit, you know, turn this and adjust this and polish this up. But once you've done that, you can actually do most of geometry as Euclid conceived it on these non-Euclidean surfaces. And that means that a lot of the techniques that I developed that work in the Euclidean plane also work in non-Euclidean geometry. They work on the sphere. So if I can turn this tiling by hexagons into this thing with regular polygons and bow ties, uh, these are 12 and 9-sided polygons and bow ties. I can turn this tiling by pentagons into this with decagons, nonagons, 9-sided, and bow ties. And the polygons in contact technique will work just fine on this as well. So I can take an originally planar design and transfer it into a truly spherical design. It's not a hack. The design is actually wrapped cleanly and perfectly around a sphere. That's just one half of non-Euclidean geometry, though. In some sense, the more famous form of non-Euclidean geometry and the, the true revolution in the history of science was the understanding of hyperbolic geometry, which was invented by a group of people, arguably Lobachevsky and Gauss and a few others back in the 1850s. Escher was heavily inspired by uh, hyperbolic geometry. He saw it as a way to capture an entire infinity, the, an entire world in the finite space of a canvas. There's nothing left here that to be represented. Every fish in an infinite plane has been mapped down in some hyperbolic way to fit in this disk. <clears throat> and sure enough, all of the same techniques that I talked about also work in hyperbolic geometry. So I can take this pattern with 12 and 9-sided polygons and get this one that has 14 and 9-sided polygons. I kind of, to get 14, I kind of need to make more space everywhere. And in some sense, that's what the uh, hyperbolic plane gives you. And so, I can transfer Euclidean star patterns into the hyperbolic plane as well. 
So here are a couple of finished designs with like colored in and, and polished up and made to look real pretty. And it's nice to group them together so that they are somehow thematic, thematically related. So they have very similar structure, but mapped into different universes. <coughs> uh, same idea here. And one more with interlacements built in. So you can see this is made out of a lot of regular hexagons. This one is made out of a lot of regular pentagons that interlace around each other. And this one is made out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven gons that wind around each other. <clears throat> there are a few other transformations of the plane I don't have time to talk about. So you can pass your design through funny functions of, co of the complex plane into itself and get these interesting conformal mappings that you can apply to Islamic star patterns. They can be applied to anything else as well, of course. Uh, here's someone who's affiliated with the Bridges Conference, that Sahela mentioned at the start, who has done these nice multi-scale Islamic star patterns, more or less by hand, by discovering ways that rosettes of different sizes can be made compatible with their neighbors. It's kind of nice. This is a very loose, much more freeform design based on gear tiles that fit together to form a nice multi-scale pattern. And uh, Joe Bartholomew has a bunch of examples like this. One more kind of arguably non-Euclidean geometry, but more freeform, would be Ramanian geometry, where curvature can change everywhere on an object. So you can talk about what is the geometry on the surface of a rabbit instead of the very well-behaved regular sphere at hyperbolic plane. And it turns out there are nice algorithms in computer graphics for decomposing something like a bunny into a bunch of roughly square regions. Not exactly square, but close enough. And if I find some symmetric pattern made out of square motifs, I can map those squares into the squares of this design and get an arbitrary surface covered with an ornamental pattern, which of course you can then apply to Islamic star patterns. So, there, it's, I, I don't find, I don't think there's, I wouldn't claim there's some natural affinity, like there's not any reason why this has to be bunnies, right? The bunny, in case you don't know, is a canonical object in computer graphics that's used as a test case for any, everything. And the only reason I use the bunny here is because that's the model I had available suitably pre-processed so that I could map these designs onto it. How I would love to be able to apply this technique to any model, but I don't have the technology to process other models in the same way. So I'm still waiting to find, for somebody to give me that, because it's a very, it's actually, my contribution, the, the fact that I map star patterns onto here is kind of trivial compared to this step, the thing that actually found those squares in the first place. That's an immensely complicated algorithm. <clears throat> and then I used it to do, you know, fun Islamic star bunnies. Which, ah, it sounds like a kind of a science fiction story. That'd be great. <laughs> All right, so final thing that, well, I guess mostly final thing is just to show you a whole bunch of applications of this stuff, how you can use this. The next great thing, once you have computer implementations of star patterns, is that there are so many wonderful technologies these days that the computer can attach to to create real world objects. So, you know, the most obvious one is a printer maybe a large format printer. So this is actually not exactly my work. I was contacted by a furniture maker in the United States who saw my designs online and he was making a circular table for a client and he said it would be really great if we could like make this be the tabletop. So I sent him a super high res version of it. He printed it out, sealed it in vinyl or something and uh, made this beautiful Islamic star table. <clears throat> I feel like, you know, you should have like, I don't know, it would be like a giant vase here and a big mug here and then you need progressively smaller glasses and stuff that you put down in each of the circles. Laser cutting is really popular these days. There are, I think, a few laser cutters in various uh, places on campus. So very simple. I mean, it really is just press a button and go. It's no harder than printing something on paper these days. Uh, so this is just a little square of wood that has been cut with a, a star pattern. If you can define the geometry of a star pattern programmatically, you can fabricate it out of flat materials. This is a slightly more ambitious version of the previous one. This is a laser cut pattern in uh, chrome plated steel, I think it is. They, they've, they've messed up the pattern a little bit. I provided the geometry and they had to make some modifications as a concession to the, uh, the practicality of cutting this. But this is, uh, 
I, I hooked up with a company in London that does uh, custom drainage. So this is a, th a drain on the floor. In fact, I think this is the drain in a foot washing station in a mosque, right? So the water is coming down from up here into this, into this drain. Um, and uh, it's kind of a nice idea, and hopefully we can get more Islamic star pattern drains, because now you know, they're so easy to design, we just need people willing to manufacture them. They, it, is, it is kind of a boutique item. It does, this kind of custom manufacturing is more expensive than mass production. But for something like an ornamental pattern in a mosque, maybe that's okay. And if you compare the cost of manufacturing this versus the cost of laying down thousands of tiny glazed tiles, maybe it doesn't, over like, you know, the Alhambra was built over like, you know, decades. Maybe it doesn't seem so bad anymore. It's okay. Here's something I did very, this was earlier this year. This is a marquetry. So the pieces of wood are cut with the laser and then manually glued together. And, you know, the nice thing to explore here is deliberate deviations from perfect geometry. So here I was inspired by glitch art where you take JPEG images and randomly change bits in them until you get something where it's all distorted and broken. And I wanted to see what that might look like geometrically applied to an Islamic star pattern. <clears throat> Here's another one where I took one of those spherical designs, projected it flat, and cut the pieces out of wood. So it's almost like a trompe l'oeil. If you look at it at the right angle, it kind of jumps out at you. And it's nice because although it's a very regular pattern, when you execute it in wood, every piece really is unique in projection, right? On the sphere, they're all the same. But in projection, they're all different, which is kind of fun. Here's a very old project using a computer-controlled cutting bit to drill out the pattern, mill out the pattern, in a block of linoleum from which you can then do linoleum block printing. And the reason I like this is because it's a nice marriage of the digital technology with hand crafting, as is the marquetry. You need, you need the handmade element, but you get the boost from the technology that gets you part of the way there. A few more examples. This is a cut out of paper. It's very thinly cut out of paper. This is actually cut not with a laser, but with a computer-controlled knife cutter, which is a little tabletop thing. And I recommend these because they're really cheap. So if you want to explore this kind of design, it's only a couple hundred dollars to get your own knife cutter. And then you can play with this kind of paper cutting. The one on the right is much more heavy duty. It's cut out of synthetic marble or something like that. Now the spherical designs, you obviously can't cut out of flat material. But the spherical designs are where you can start to play with 3D printing, which is so much fun. So I've been doing a lot of 3D printing in the last few years, and one natural thing to apply that to are these spherical Islamic star patterns. This is about three inches or four inches big, made out of plastic. This one is actually a, an inch across, you can tell by the fingers, and that one's silver. So the way the silver process works is they print 3D in uh, wax, and then they do that, you use the lost wax casting from that wax positive. A couple more in plastic. If anybody wants to look after I'm done in two minutes, I did bring the, the black one along, so you can have a look. So there's, there's the, uh, the black one. It's only four inches across. They're kind of nice. In, uh, Shapeways will let you do 3D printing in gold. It's not cheap, uh, but maybe someday I'll try gold. No, I haven't tried that. Uh, most of the examples are in plastic. Here's, uh, you know, have to do the bunny. So there's the bunny with an Islamic star pattern mapped onto it and then 3D printed. Okay, so last little bit is where do I want to go with this stuff? What's next? There are other styles of Islamic star pattern design that I haven't even touched on. The style I've talked about is the style that's much more popular in, uh, in Persia, you know, in Iran, for example. But if you go to Morocco, you see a very different style of recognizably Islamic art emerge. What you get, so these are all fountains in Fez, which hopefully I'm going to go to next spring, see them firsthand. These fountains are all executed in Zilij tiles, glazed terracotta tiles, thousands and thousands of tiny little tiles. Um, and what you typically have that you don't have in the designs I showed you are a large, many-pointed central star with the design radiating out from that. And that central star can get really big. So there are some designs that have the largest that typically is practiced in the world is about 100 points, actually 96 points. But I think they refer to it as 100. And it's, again, made out of all of these very fine uh, glazed tiles. The tiles themselves are pretty amazing. Like, I don't know if you've seen the way these things are cut, right? But they're, 
They, they fabricate sheets of tile and then cut the individual tiles out of the finished baked sheets with fine axes. So they'll scrape the design into, into the tile and then chop off the bits they don't want until they get exactly this final shape as a result. Incredibly hard. Uh, the, the really skilled craftsmen can only make a couple of hundred of these tiles a day. And a, a fountain might require you know, tens of thousands of them. <clears throat> I haven't yet developed the algorithms I need to produce these automatically. I have drawn some of them by hand just to see what's involved, what the challenges are. And it's kind of interesting because you, you see that there are different zones where different things happen. So a lot of this stuff is actually pretty easy and regular based on well-known tile shapes. And the central star, the central rosette, is also pretty straightforward because it's perfectly symmetrical. It's this transition zone that gets hard, where you have to reconcile this 24-fold symmetry with the 8- and 16-fold symmetry of what's going on around it. And so some of these tiles are compromises. They're not perfect. They're kind of distorted or slightly irregular. And that's something that computer science is not very good at. Whenever you need something that's not quite right, you have to tell the computer a lot about how that might work. You have to explain the nature of the compromise to the computer so it can somehow balance all the opposing forces trying to make that shape be what it is. So that's work in progress. Here's one more example of uh, that kind of design. So I took another kind of 24-fold Zilich pattern, turned it into a laptop skin. This actually has a funny story associated with it. My PhD student who was working on an unrelated topic wanted to create a research poster that included me. So she said, well, you need to give me a design to put on your shirt in the poster. So I gave her this, the laptop skin design so that, you know, it's very clearly me in the poster. And then the poster won an award at the conference where it was presented. So I had to somehow respond to this. And the way I responded was I actually had <laughs> the design printed on a real T-shirt. So there I am. There I am wearing the thing. One more thing I want to say is just that some of these beautiful patterns seem to incorporate multiple scales at once. So if you look at this pattern, you see lots of small elements that make it up. These are traditional lead shapes. But you can also pick out some of the elements, color them in black, and they seem to form a very similar design at a larger scale. And maybe that can re be repeated again and again and again. And so there's this beautiful notion of self-similar multi-scale designs that you can see here. And then, in fact, you can also see in the work of Lewin Steinhardt with these black lines. And I think there's a lot of wonderful ideas that can be explored in how individual tile shapes can themselves be seen as composed of smaller copies of themselves in a process that can repeat recursively you know, down to infinity to make beautiful designs. OK, so that is my crazy uh, brief tour through some of the work I've done uh, with Islamic star patterns. And if you want to reach me, if you want to ask me about the math, the computer science, the art, to the best of my knowledge, I'm easy to find, email, web, Twitter, if you really want. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks. All right. And should I pass this around if anybody wants to look at it here? <coughs> Yeah, Tara. So I think the last two slides I'm going to ask you actually if there are any examples of the kind of recursive. Like, yeah. Because it doesn't seem like they have kind of made like or the artists discovered fractal patterns. You know, like a star was in a star was just like a. Not yes and no. I mean, like this to me is a this looks like stars within stars, but not quite at that at that fractal. Like it, it's not the same. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Like. You know, when you say star within a star within a star within a star, you know, I really, I really think of something more like that, where you have things at all levels of detail all interacting in one canvas. Um, but that's, there, there certainly are historical examples where things are happening at multiple scales at once. Uh, and in fact, Jay Bonner says that there's one that's even three levels all together in one design. Uh, but there should be more. It's like, you know, there's some, there's some of these. And I don't know what they were thinking when they designed them. And I want to understand it better. Like, I don't think they understood aperiodic tilings. But it would be interesting to know if they had some sense of infinity, of, of the implied infinity that you can get by repeating this process. That I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it's 
rare because it's also harder to you know, make a, 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 a large scale. It's very laborious. So. That's, that's an interesting question. I, I'm, I'm, I've debated for a long time in, in my head just how hard this is. Like, if I create kind of an arbitrary arrangement of these small tiles, can I always pick out a larger scale design? Maybe I sort of can. Maybe, you know, these small tiles fit together in a limited number of ways, and you'll always be able to trace out these coarser paths. Or, you know, it, it, it's, it's not too hard to speculate that the typical ways you might put these tiles together naturally yield this self-similarity in a way that, like, some artisan 500 years ago would have said, huh, yeah, that's kind of cool, but not really thought about the further mathematical implications. Anyway, so it's something that needs to be explored more, for sure. Yeah, question. Uh, what software are you using? Uh, what's, what's the software? OK, that's a good question. Um, well, no, so, oh, I, okay, so I mean, the software that I'm using, this thing is my own software that I wrote, obviously. It's all written in Java, um, which, you know, it's funny because Java as a programming language, Java's getting harder and harder to actually use and maintain. It's, this is a totally, like, boring computer nerd software engineer thing, but, like, Java's kind of falling out of favor in the world, as far as I can tell, so I'll probably stop using it. Yeah, that's true. They, yeah, the newest version of Java is a nice language, but it's, it's not very well maintained anymore. The problem is that Java belonged to Sun, which was bought by what? By Oracle, which is now part of HP, I think, or something. Anyway. So uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a whole separate question of the software engineering issue. I would very much like to rewrite this software. I would love to make this like an iPad app so everybody can use it. There's very limited availability of apps related to Islamic star pattern design. There's one that came out recently, and it's really not very good, unfortunately. Um, so there's, there's, I think there's a need there. If you're interested, and I, I didn't get around to saying this, um, you can try my software online. So go to my homepage, and then uh, actually, you know what's easier? It's called Tap Rats. So if you just do a web search on Tap Rats, I'm sure you'll find it. So there's my implementation of tap rats and you can like there's an online applet version that you can try there's supposed to be a downloadable application version it's getting harder and harder like i said like if you try to run the applet it's it's even odds that your browser will tell you oh i don't want to run that for you it could be dangerous like because browsers are getting fussy about java but you can also go to this version which is uh which is good someone took my older source code and uh made their own applet called Tap Rats. Oh, that's not a very good demonstration of that. Anyway, do a web search on this, and you'll find it if you're interested. So that would give you those designs? And then it's not exactly the program that you see on the screen there, but it's very similar. It does a lot of the same stuff. Eventually, you know, watch this channel. There will be wonderful iPad apps that everyone can use, fingers crossed. So like the Tokambi scroll, do you know what they are? Like what's the problem? I can't remember exactly. I think it's something like 16th century. It's old. It's old. Whereas the Mirza Akbar scrolls, you know, nobody really knows. It, it kind of looks like they were done last Tuesday, right? So the, the copy scroll is much more like a, a historical document that people are very serious about. Whereas Mirza Akbar, it's on display in the V&A, but uh, it's not as clear how historical it is. It's also more architectural than pattern-based. The, uh, the copy scroll, there's a wonderful, incredible book uh, that is both a presentation of the scroll and a deep analysis of everything that's in it. Unfortunately, the book is out of print. Uh, and like, if you want to buy a copy, they're easily like hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. So someday, right, I will have a copy that I can show you. <coughs> so one thing you mentioned basically is like, you know, culture, you know, it's like, and you study kind of, like, you kind of, sometimes you study culture in your world to understand the art. And I'm thinking it's like, you know, like, I mean, uh, Western Europe, especially with the Renaissance, you know, culture is like, uh, Shapes in motion and based on you know, classical uh, art, you know, like ancient Greek art, and whereas say Byzantium, Byzantine art basically is like very kind of like to our eyes now, like very kind of like, stilted and like, uh, and it was, so these, I mean, like, uh, you know, they can't draw like human shapes, as you said, so geometric uh, patterns. But what about, say, perspective? Did they ever seem to like, hmm. like, uh, find perspective in it, or, like in the Renaissance, or did they not? You mean in Islamic art? Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, there, to, to my knowledge, no. I mean, you, you, wouldn't, 
there's no real opportunity in Islamic star pattern, other geometric design, to express perspective. I mean, and you wouldn't want to, because if you look at you know, how Islamic star patterns are used, it's used architecturally, so on a wall or on a book. Any explicit use of perspective would, um, would, would make it really unsettling to look at, I think. You wouldn't want a wall covered with tiles that appear to like, be receding into the distance with some kind of trompe l'oeil. <laughs> You know, there are other traditions in Islamic art. Like, you know, we talk about the fact that Islamic art is all abstract and never figurative. It's actually not true, right? There is a, a tradition, for example, of Turkish uh, miniature painting in which you see human figures. You would never see figurative painting in a mosque, but that doesn't mean that people would not have portraits hung in their homes. And if you look at a lot of that old figurative painting, again, you don't see a lot of perspective. So. I don't know. It's an interesting question. I don't know what the relationship is between uh, classical Islamic art and the use of perspective. I suspect that it does not play an important role in the artistic tradition. Um, Do you have, a, you have a comment on that? I think that for my understanding is that the Western art tradition and the Islamic art tradition comes from a very different ways of thinking about how to create art. So from Renaissance and people like Michelangelo, their aim was to create a picture that almost resembles real life. So that, that kind of a thinking yep. is quite different from Islamic artists and people who do the ties that come from thinking about, not thinking about sort of any kind of an imitation of real life, yeah. but starting with math, starting with those patterns, and then seeing what comes out of it. So that kind of a difference creates different ways of thinking. So even though when you look at miniature paintings, I think they, they're more interested in that sort of a surface quality or storytelling yeah. rather than trying to create uh, what Michelangelo did was that actual study of human figure in details to create a drawing that almost looks real. But I attended like, uh, I think a few weeks ago that uh, Bridget lecture you were at, and so a medievalist like a painter, yeah. so he made the controversial claim that, uh, I don't know if that's true, but the ancient, if you have example, ancient, uh, ancient Egyptians, they understood perspective, but they yeah. not to use it, which I don't yeah. know think of that. That's <laughs> that, was, that was interesting, and I haven't heard that before either. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, we totally, yeah, we got perspective, sure. <laughs> no, we just, we're, we're above it. We don't like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you'd think there would be some evidence of the use of perspective before the Renaissance if it had been invented and used seriously. Um, but yeah, I, I liked. I, I liked. Yeah, thanks for that comment. I mean, I, I haven't spent a huge. Uh, with, with the kind of uh, math and geometry that they had, I would assume they could have figured out a one point or two point perspective and use it. Hmm. It's just a matter of do, do I want to have that kind of imitation or do I want they to work for the surface? That's an interesting, I, it's a nice, theory. it would be fun to explore that more deeply. Like, I'd love to see it, you know, the one example where some Islamic scholar like drew something in perspective. Um, but I, I've never seen it, yeah. And you're, uh, yeah, I've, I haven't spent a lot of time with miniature paintings, but they, they tend to be more, almost symbolic, more like cartoons, right? Like you said, narrative. They're, they're sort of spatial configuration yeah. is really different of thinking of what is closer is further down, it's yeah. sort of a linear planes that go up and down rather than going in. I guess they come from different traditions. But like, yeah, I'm thinking like, uh, since the invention of the camera photography, it's like, you know, even in our current of art, it's kind of like, kind of uh, as a reaction against that, it's now, you know, 20th century, like kind of abstract. Yeah. So even though it's not like, you know, pattern, like geometric pattern, but it's like kind of like, you know, it's like, uh, becoming more, uh, at least, uh, you know, avant-garde art is more uh, abstract, tries to be like, away from like the realistic picture, I'm thinking like, uh, I don't know, it's like, maybe there's some possible like meaning, but. Yeah, and I think that's, that, that's actually a good difference. So the invention of photography basically took away what a lot of artists were trying yeah. to do was that was capturing real life. So they basically have to start over defining what something like painting is, if you're not trying to, make a loss that looks like a real loss, what else can you do? Yeah. So that opens up the space for abstraction. For sure. Yeah, uh, there's a question there. Uh, yeah, I have a question. So I see that most of the, uh, the, uh, the work done by the Islamic arts, all of these stars, they're based on, on uh, five goals or seven goals or ten goals or eleven goals, which are all constructible goals, as we know. 
Uh, not 7 or 11. I, if you mean constructible in like the formal mathematical sense, 5 is, but uh, 11 is not. Uh, the, uh, yeah, 11 won't be. And 7 isn't either. But as with the Pentagon, there are Islamic star patterns with seven-pointed stars traditionally, and those, again, would have been drawn using clever approximations of regular seven uh, gons, which is great. What's with and ten gons as well? Ten is constructible, because if you can construct an n-gon, you can also construct a two n-gon. That's not hard. Like, did they have like a method of constructing these n-gons? Well, some of it would have been taken directly from Euclid, and it would have been done with compass and straight edge. Um, there's no, as far as I know, there's no general method for constructing an n-gon uh, like that, that avoids using trigonometry. Like to construct an arbitrary regular n-gon, you kind of need, um, you need to know about sines and cosines. You need to be able to compute them. Otherwise, I'm not sure. It would be interesting. Is there some like way to take seven sticks and put them in a circle and sort of juggle them until they even out as much as possible. I'm not sure. Um, uh, but five, for sure, they would have known how to draw a regular pentagon. It's, yeah, I, I kind of don't know what they did for irregular stuff like seven and, uh, and 11. I guess there is at least one example that's got 11-sided polygons in it. Um, whether they would have just eyeballed it until it looked good or done some kind of approximation based on an understanding of the math or what, I, yeah. I mean, maybe someone somewhere freehand drew like a really good 11 gone, and everyone from then on went to his house and like traced it for like, you know, like fire. You know, you have to preserve the 11 gone for all of history. <coughs> yeah. So you, you call them like uh, Islamic star pattern, and I'm thinking, what's a distinguishing pattern? Like why, what makes them Islamic? I mean, like uh, you go to Microsoft office and you try to draw, you know, they have like, star pattern on the, like, on the paper, you know, like on the screen, like five, six, seven, eight, four stars. So what the distinguishing part, you know, Islamic star pattern that makes it not star, compared to just regular star, the recurring pattern, the, what, what's the? There's no, uh, there's no one true definition of what makes an Islamic star pattern an Islamic star pattern. And like, you know, it's not a, it's not a private club. Uh, um, I mean, it's really just, uh, the best definition is probably just the historical collection of things that were, that, that are considered Islamic star patterns. If you look at like books on Islamic art, they have a hard time. They struggle trying to define what Islamic art is. And that's fair. It's be, you know, Islamic art is practiced over more than a millennium, right? Easily, you know, 13, 1400 years. Um, all over the, there goes that. Over a huge part of the world with lots of regional styles. And a lot of it was practiced by people who weren't even Muslim, right? But were uh, Jews and Christians living under caliphate rule in that part of the world. So, you know, what gets to be called Islamic art at all? It's like a characteristic of you know, recurring pattern. Uh, and yeah, I guess like uh, sort of similar. Structure. Not even. I mean, I, I can't remember what I wrote in my thesis. I mean, I, I said something like it would be unproductive to try to spend a lot of time coming up with a formal definition, a mathematical definition, so I can test, does this have Islamic star pattern nature or doesn't it? Uh, and it's better to say it's just a, a pattern made out of a lot of regular stars and whatever else is needed to join things together. Uh, but, you know, what makes something Islamic art is what people say it is, uh, just as with the rest of art. It, there are people practicing Islamic art today who produce things that are very, very different from anything that I was able to show you here. I mean, I saw uh, another thing I saw at the Victoria and Albert Museum uh, earlier this year was the, the, a gallery of the finalists of the Jamil III Prize, which is a, uh, an annual prize given out for contemporary Islamic art. And, you know, there's wonderful things going on in contemporary Islamic art that would not look anything like this. I mean, Sahel has done some incredibly nice installations that uh, pay homage to the tradition of Islamic art, but look nothing like it. I mean, uh, laser-cut palettes, sorry, right? I was going to sort of comment of seeing people, the work that you do actually brings, it's very important for me as a contemporary artist, because as a contemporary artist, I may not be interested in actually to, in the craftsmanship of making something that's, that's that tedious, because partly because 
But it is part of the work that I do. It's not that the craftsmanship yeah. in it. It's the concept behind it. It's the appropriation that comes from that cultural background or comes from ideas that I have. So it actually works better for me sometimes if I take my hand away and let a laser printer to do an image, something that is basically easily done, but then as the audience you come in and you start thinking about the other ideas that are underlying rather than this object as sort of a precious art object that an artist spent hours and hours to make. But as the kind of the artist that you know does these patterns, and if you take that away from you, I mean, do you kind of do something in that process if you don't spend the time? I mean, do you do something there? No, I, I don't because it actually it, it makes more my work harder to to come up with ideas that I can attach <laughs> yeah. to rather than making these things. So it's a it's a different way of creating art. Right, but that and that's your personal expression of art. There are other artists who practice this who undoubtedly would feel that something is lost when you create these by computer as opposed to by hand. And that's great. I mean, I want there to be people who continue to practice these designs by hand because they'll see things in the designs and, and innovate in ways that I won't. Um, and maybe I can use some of those ideas and maybe I can. Maybe I just have to admire them. <clears throat> Other questions? Or should we? Uh, we're already running over, I guess. Any other questions? No? Thank you, everybody. Thanks for, for sticking around. Thank you.